What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of the sit down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think in the comment section below. Also, if you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock and seen this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get in to another very interesting organized crime topic. And we've all heard the names of the bosses of the New York mob, the ones we know about, John Gotti, Paul Castellano, Carmine Persico, Carlo Gambino. We've all heard about them. But what about some of the guys we don't hear about? Men that made a ton of money, controlled many interests, and truly transformed New York City as one of the preeminent criminal locales in America. Today, we're going to get into one of those individuals, a man they called Tony Ducks. The story of Anthony Carallo. Next on Sit Down Shorts, Anthony Carallo was born February 12th, 1913, in East Harlem. Now, during those times, East Harlem was uh, a Renaissance area for Italians that had come over from Italy and Sicily. Uh, for many years, East Harlem uh, was one of the really preeminent Italian enclaves in America. It had one of the largest Italian populations, not only on the East Coast, but in the country. Uh, and if you know anything about mob lore, a lot of uh, individuals from the mafia came from East Harlem. Obviously, uh, Tony Salerno, uh, Mike Coppola, uh, all sorts of different uh, individuals came from that Italian enclave. Now, Tony Ducks Corallo uh, grew up really for the first several years of his life with his father. That would be until the age of six. In 1919, Tony Duck's uh, father, who was a barber at the time, would actually pass away in the 1919 flu pandemic, which uh, we don't hear much about. But obviously, with the emergence of coronavirus over the last couple of years, we've heard the 1918-1919 flu pandemic a lot. Corallo's father would pass away, and he would be fatherless uh, really, and have to fend for himself. Um, he would obviously get into the streets because he because he would learn that his job as a tile setter uh, wasn't going to make him a ton of money. Look, at the, during those times, like we see in many ethnic neighborhoods, the lure to the streets is all too important. Why be a tile setter, a barber, a mechanic when you can make a whole lot more money? In the streets. This is something we see time and time and time again. Whether you're a drug trafficker, uh, a gangster, uh, a swindler, it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter where you grow up. There's always going to be that gangster making more money than the local people doing blue collar jobs. For Tony uh, Corallo, he would slot right in to a gr group out of Harlem called the 107th Street Gang. At those points uh, in history, that would be run by an individual called Tommy Lucchese. Obviously, also, if you know anything about Lucky Luciano, he ran with that crew as well. It was a breeding ground for young gangsters, and it was oversaw by legendary Gagliano crime family member, Tommy Reyna, who operated out of the Bronx. Now, eventually, the Gagliano crime family would make way to the present-day Lucchese crime family in the early 50s when Tommy Lucchese would take over. Now, for Tony Ducks Corallo, he would quickly uh, help himself in the world of being a gangster. He would quickly learn and become a sponge under people like Tommy Three Fingers Brown Lucchese, Gaetano Reyna, and John Johnny Dio, Dio Guardi. Now, the thing about Dio Guardi and Lucchese that would provide very helpful to Tony Ducks was the fact that they were very involved and immersed in labor racketeering, grabbing unions, grabbing industry, and putting their tentacles on it and stealing money out of these different locales every week, every month, every year. Johnny Dia was particularly big in the garment district in New York, which in those times, in the late 30s, early 40s, and into the 50s, the garment district was big business for the mafia. They would also infiltrate local unions through things called paper unions, which we'll get into, and really staff them with, quote, our people, which is basically code for um, people that we control that do what we say and pump money up to us. For Tony Corallo, 
he was learning something that he could never get in school or as a tile setter. In the early 40s, though, Tony Ducks Corrala would start to get uh, involved with other things as well. And this would lead to uh, several different arrests. In 1941, Tony Ducks Corrala would dip his toes into the drug trade. He would be caught with over $100,000 worth of heroin and a large amount of cash. Now, for Tony Ducks, this would create the legend of his fascinating nickname, Tony Ducks. During that drug investigation, I don't know if it had to do with Tommy Brown's um, uh, uh, you know, ability to win over the law or his uh, power, but uh, Tony Ducks Corrala would only get slapped on the wrist with a very short prison sentence in Rikers Island. Keep in mind, he had hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of drugs, uh, but he was able to wiggle out of it. Between 1941 and 1960, Tony Ducks Corrala would be arrested 12 different times, and this would create that very famous nickname. At one point, Tommy Lucchese would basically say, look, Tony ducked again. He ducked a subpoena. He ducked an arrest. He ducked a trial. That would create the nickname. Now, Tony Ducks Corrala was starting to make a large amount of money. He was involved with unions and really hadn't done any prison time, so he didn't miss any time being on the street. That would allow him to leave East Harlem and head out to the fashionable area of Malba, in Queens. If you know anything about Malba, it is situated in northern Queens and it is one of the most posh uh, neighborhoods in that borough. Seen here are photos uh, from present day Malba, but even back then, uh, there were very fashionable, high priced homes. And that's where Tony Ducks moved his family. It was said that Tony Ducks Corrala would live at 11467 8th Avenue in Malba. Things were good for Tony Corallo. He was learning from the likes of Tommy Lucchese and Johnny Dio, and he was fast-tracking his way to the upper echelons of the Lucchese crime family. In 1943, Tony Ducks Corallo would be made capo of his own crew. And as I said earlier, not only would he, but Johnny Dio became very immersed in creating a... Uh, thing they called paper unions. They would basically go to defunct or a low performing unions and basically infiltrate them through staffing their own people in these defunct unions that would allow them to overtake them and or infiltrate other unions uh, that would allow cash to be thrown up to the top upper echelons. And they, by the um, mid forties owned uh, all sorts of different unions. Tony Ducks Corral, it was said, owned at least five locals of the Teamsters Union. He dominated other unions as well, including the Toy and Novelties Worker Union, the Painter and Decorator Union, the Food Handler and Conduit Worker Unions, as well as the different United Textile Worker Unions. He controlled a lot of unions, and that would continue throughout his 40-plus year reign uh, as a high-ranking member of the Lucchese crime family. Now, in the early 60s, as I said, uh, Tony Ducks Corallo continued to evade long prison sentences. He really hadn't went to prison much at all. Uh, but in 1962, uh, he would finally get hit a little bit on the wrist for an issue that he had. Uh, Tony Ducks Corallo in 1962 would get two years in prison after he attempted to bribe a member of the New York State Supreme Court in a bankruptcy case. Not something you want to do. And ultimately, that uh, Supreme Court justice uh, would uh, bring him on a bribery case and he would have to do a little prison time. Now, while he was in prison in the early to mid 60s, Tommy Lucchese eventually got sick. And in 1967, Tommy Lucchese would die that year. Now, the thing for uh, Tony Ducks was he was next in line. He was going to be the next boss of the Lucchese crime family. The problem for uh, Tony Ducks Corallo was he was embroiled in a scheme uh, with uh, a member of the uh, New York uh, City uh, overseers. Tony Ducks Corallo bribed an individual called James Marcus in a kickback scheme involving the creation of the Jerome Park Reservoir in the Bronx. According to reports, James L. Marcus, who was a water commissioner, uh, was in uh, to Tony Ducks Corral in a loan sharking debt that he owed. In paying back that, he decided to 
uh, allow ducks to be involved in all sorts of uh, kickbacks involving this uh, creation of this uh, reservoir. And he and Tony Ducks would be jammed up in that case. James Marcus will get a prison sentence uh, as uh, he was involved in the scheme. And Tony Ducks would get one as well. He would ultimately be uh, convicted and get three years in prison for bribery. Uh, and he would have to head off to prison, which was bad news for Tony Ducks because he should have been the next boss. Now, he was boss in waiting, but it would delay uh, his uh, official title for about three years. Now, during his incarceration, Carmine Tremonti would be the acting boss of the Lucchese crime family. In 1970, when Corallo would be released, he would be made official boss of the Lucchese crime family. Now, upon his new mantled position, Tony Ducks just continued making more and more and more money. Now, by this point, he was very involved in the waste hauling business, hijacking at JFK Airport, as well as the gravel industry, as well as other unions, including concrete, the textile union workers, and different Teamster locals. Things were huge for Tony. Corallo. And for Tony Corallo and the Lucchese crime family, this was always something that I find very underrated about them. We hear about the Genovese crime fam family and the Gambino crime family, but Tony Ducks Corallo made them a very powerful family and took them into industries that we just don't think of as much as we do with the drug dealing and the extortion and the bookmaking. Um, Tony Ducks had learned all this in the 40s under legends like Tommy Lucchese. Now, during his time as boss, uh, one of his closest confidants was an individual called Salvatore Abellino. Now, Abellino would act as his chauffeur and close confidant, and this would create a real problem for Tony Ducks down the road. Now, during the uh, early to mid-70s, the New York State uh, prosecutors and or law enforcement were attempting to build cases on members of the mob that were involved in the garbage industry. Now, Sal Abellino was very involved uh, with the waste uh, hauling industry, as well as uh, a laborers union in Long Island. He and his brother were very involved in different waste hauling companies and things of that nature. And what they tried to do during that time is persuade members of the public that owned the waste hauling companies in Long Island to basically get down or lay down. And we've all heard the story about Robert Kubeka and Donald Barstow. They were independent garbage owners of a company in New York, a small company on Long Island, and they decided not to get involved with the mafia. But what the New York State uh, organized crime officials did was uh, they basically wired for sound uh, Robert Kubeka, and they would find out that a lot of the uh, involvement that Avellino had was with Corallo in his Jaguar. This would induce down the road the very famous Jaguar bug. In 1983, uh, New York State crime officials would install a bug in this Jaguar that Salvatore Avellino owned that he would chauffeur Corallo around with. According to reports, an individual that worked for the New York State Organized Crime Commission called Richard Tenian would install a bug as Avellino had dinner with his wife at a restaurant called the Huntington Townhouse in Long Island. Now, this would be a treasure trove of info and be one of the most damaging wiretaps to ever affect the mafia, particularly Tony Corral, but it would affect pretty much everybody involved in the mafia. And I'm going to get to some of those reasonings right now. One thing it would, it would uncover is in June of 1983, the officials would find out that the mob had set up a meeting at this business the Bari Restaurant Distributors at 234 Bowery Street in Lower Manhattan. What they learned was on June 14th, 1983, members of the mafia were going to have a meeting to discuss the concrete club and the concrete business. They were going to divvy up the millions of dollars in profits that they were scheming off the top of the various concrete projects in New York. And they couldn't believe that they got this through this Jaguar bug. So what they did was they would stake out this place and who they would see walking in, Tony Corallo, Tom McSantoro, the consigliere of the Lucchese crime family, Genovese, 
big time boss, Tony Salerno, Colombo powerhouse, Jerry Lang, Langella, and Gambino boss and heavyweight, Paul Castellano. They would see all these individuals walk into this restaurant uh, and distributor right off uh, of Bowery between Spring and Houston Streets. They would all be in plain sight. Now, the problem for the feds and for the state was Paul Castellano would realize that uh, an agent was peering through the window and all the big time uh, mobsters uh, scattered, basically. At one point, Vinny the Fish Cafaro, seen on the right, who was at present for this meeting with Tony Salerno, uh, he would say that at one point, uh, Tony Ducks Cor uh, Corallo made it out, but Tony Salerno had trouble getting through a window. Quote, there were agents there. Tony Salerno said, I had to get through a window. They had to push me through the window to get out. I couldn't fit. I was too fat. So Tony Salerno had trouble getting out of a window as he tried to escape. Pretty incredible. Uh, but this is the kind of dividends that the Jaguar bug would pay for the mafia and for the people that uh, were investigating the mafia. Now, Tony uh, Corallo would also be caught on wiretap saying some very other uh, potent things that would eventually get him uh, really jammed up. At one point, Salvatore Avellino would say on wiretap to Corallo, quote, this is what I'm looking for. You see, let's designate someone for that union office. We want to put a delegate. That's our fucking union. Not Jimmy Brown's union, not Paul Castellano. It's our union. Let's take a son of ours, a son-in-law. Put them in that office. They got a job. Let's take somebody's daughter. She's the secretary. Let's staff it with our people. Now, Corallo would also be caught himself on wiretap talking about the drug business and how he didn't want individuals in his family selling drugs. Quote, I couldn't be any fucking plainer than I was with some of these guys. I don't want anyone fucking around with junk. They got to be killed. That's all. Fuck this shit. You cannot be in the narcotics business and flat on your stomach. You got to be exposed to it. You got to get out on the street. You've got to sell it. You can't be in the junk business without going in the fucking streets and selling this cocksucking shit. We should kill them. We should have it some examples. All right. These wiretaps were incredibly damaging, not only to Tony Corallo, but to Sal Valino and to other members of the New York Mafia. In 1985, in early March of that year, Tony Ducks Corallo would be arrested alongside other members of the Mafia, including members of his own family, including underboss Tomic Santoro and Consigliere. Christy Tick Funeri. Other members of other families would be jammed up as well. And this would set up the very famous commission case in the mid 80s. For Tony Corallo, the writing was on the wall. They had wiretaps, they had proof. They also had prevailing murders that were hanging over the family that they could connect to not only Corallo, but other members of the mafia. We have to remember. There are certain individuals that definitely aided in ending the mafia as we know it in New York City. People like John Gotti, Paul Castellano, and other people. But the biggest issue the mob had wasn't John Gotti or Paul Castellano or Carlo Gambino or Carmine Persico. It was the RICO statute. The RICO statute did immeasurable damage to the mafia. And for people like Tony Corallo, there wasn't really much fighting he could do. In 1986, he would be convicted on all counts. And in early 1987, Tony Ducks Corallo would be hit with a 100-year sentence. Here he is in the late years of his life in a truly incredible photo in prison alongside his old friend, Fat Tony Salerno. Could you imagine being a fly on the wall hearing some of those conversations? Pretty incredible. In 2000, Tony Ducks Corallo would die of natural causes at the Federal Medical Center for Prisoners in Springfield, Missouri. He was 87 years old. Now, during his later years, it was said that Tony Ducks Corallo would live in this beautiful home on Long Island. 
It was said that Tony Ducks Corallo loved gardening. He also enjoyed a nice glass of wine and pasta. It was also said that he loved sweaters and opera music. Something we don't hear much about when it comes gangsters to some of the things that they enjoy. For Tony Corallo, though, it was opera, good music, a nice bottle of wine, maybe a penne or a rigatoni. Sounds pretty nice, doesn't it? I, for one, will tell you this. When I am in my 60s and 70s, I will definitely be a gardener. I think that's definitely a good thing for me to do. Uh, but for Tony Corallo, it wasn't, uh, you know, gambling and broads and clubs. He was hanging out like any other old guy. Um, and let's be honest, he looks just like your grandfather, doesn't he? Got that cardigan sweater that they all wear. And, you know, look, in the end, I, I, I joke, but Tony Corallo was really one of the last of the great mob bosses in New York. It's that simple. He was one of the more powerful, wealthy individuals the mob has ever seen. He was nondescript. And outside of that Jaguar bug, he really didn't do much of anything. The problem was, though, we can be little people like John Gotti for talking on camera. But in the end, I don't know if there was a more recorded boss in history than Tony Ducks Corallo. It was his own mouth that did him in. He didn't know it, but it did. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button. Make sure you subscribe so you never miss another video. And if you want more great organized crime and other crime content, check out my podcast, The Sit Down, a crime history podcast presented by Barstool Sports. You can find the link to that show in the description below this video. We'll see you next time here on The Sit Down.